Welcome to MentorCore's presentation. We have the delight of having Mary Shirley with us today. Mary is a, a, a colleague that I've known for a number of years. She is a thought leader in the compliance and ethics space. She has spoken across the world and we are thrilled to have her with us today. She's gonna to talk about being a global citizen and what an international career in this profession looks like. So Mary, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what we're gonna talk about today? Wonderful, thank you so much, Lisa Beth and Daniel for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm really pleased. And thank you everyone so much for joining. So um, today I wanted to, to, to chat with everyone a little bit about what it's like on two sides of the fence, um, to be in a position where you might be thinking about um, moving somewhere that's different to where you're originally from or you're domiciled. And then from the, the, the other aspect of what it's like when you've, you're surrounded by or in the company of people who um, have different cultures to you and how you can best Im immerse them uh, in your environment and give them a sense of belonging so that you're really including them uh, in, the, um, in the world that you live in and, and making them feel like there is a space for them. So a little bit about me. Um, I am a New Zealand qualified lawyer and I currently work at, at Fresenius Medical Care, which is uh, a dialysis manufacturer, um, seller of products and provider of, of, of dialysis treatments and services. And I have the distinct um, pleasure of working under an FCPA monitorship. I learn more and more uh, about these practices and compliance programs uh, on a daily basis and what it's like um, working under a monitorship as well. So things are super exciting for me. Uh, in my spare time, I co-host a podcast which is called Great Women in Compliance. And the aim of that podcast is to really put a spotlight on the achievements of women who have accomplished many different things in the field, um, as well as serve as a knowledge sharing platform so that uh, people from all around the world have a chance to learn from others. So even if you're in a smaller department or perhaps um, a one-man band, uh, you've got built-in mentors to teach you new things. And uh, the final bullet point there, describing myself as an international citizen. So um, 10 years ago, um, almost to the day, in fact, on, on June 28, 2010, I made the decision to move to Singapore. Uh, I knew nothing about uh, Singapore. I didn't know the ethnicity of the people I'd never been to visit. I knew nothing about the cultural practices. Uh, I just packed a suitcase um, and joined a law firm and off I went. So um, in that time, I have moved my definition from being a New Zealander. Um, I have very much uh, thought about my Asian heritage. I'm half Hong Kong Chinese and had grown up in a, a very Western environment. And so until I got the chance to live in Asia, that wasn't drawn out as much. And I, I feel much more uh, in touch with that side of my heritage. And I've had an opportunity to move beyond Singapore, um, although I, you'll note I did actually return to Singapore and did a, a second stint later on. Um, I've lived in Hong Kong twice, the Middle East, um, in Dubai, and I'm currently placed in Boston um, who knows how long until the itchy feet happen again. Really quickly, I want to add in, um, if you haven't listened to the Great Women in Compliance podcast, Mary does a phenomenal job and her co-host Lisa does as well. It's one of those go-to items on my own podcast listening list. Um, so, you know, thank you for everything you're doing in the profession to help people connect. Thank you for those kind words, Lisa Beth. So today I'm going to talk about three things. Uh, the first thing I'm going to mention are some of the benefits and lessons learned of living in other countries. The second are some tips and advice for how you might secure your own international position. And the third um, is talking about that sense of belonging and inclusiveness. So if you're looking to stay at home and in a pandemic, that's certainly understandable. What is it that you can do to those newbies around you who you, you may not feel so sure about because what do you necessarily have in common? So I wanna help you to find some common ground 
uh, help you to um, think about some of the things that they might be needing in terms of information from locals and how to convert that into to being more inclusive. All right, so the first thing are the benefits. Um, living overseas has many benefits. There are some, some downsides as well. Um, so currently for me, my visa is up for renewal in the United States and um, overseas consulates have not been processing visas since around about the 20th of March. So I don't wanna dwell on that, but I th thought it wouldn't be a balanced view to just say it's all sunshine and rainbows. Um, but some of the, the material benefits that I've found is that when you uh, live in another place, uh, you have such easy uh, access to short weekends away. You can really make the most of the geographical locations around you um, and it, it keeps the cost down. So you can explore the world in a very economical way and you're never really thinking, oh, it's like a year until my next trip because you've probably got something close by planned, um, which is different to when you're living somewhere and, and you have to save up for a long distance journey. Uh, so new places are closer. The other thing is that um, I moved at the age of 27 and I thought of myself as being pretty adult uh, at that time, uh, but it transpired that I really didn't know a lot about the world and uh, living in another place was hugely eye-opening in terms of understanding my worldview was incredibly narrow at the time and it probably still is quite narrow, but it's been broadened since. Another thing is that the, the types of people you might not otherwise meet. Um, of course, it's just simple maths. Uh, you are exposing yourself to other communities and you come across a whole new world of opportunity for making connections uh, with people who uh, share your values, um, can offer you great new experiences and wonderful company. On the work front, um, what I found is one of the barriers in compliance is that especially on the cultural side, it's really hard to empathize with colleagues when you don't always understand where they're coming from. And one of the, my favorite ones is um, uh, the, the, the cultural giving of white envelopes um, or cash in some way at uh, uh, funerals in Asia, which is quite a common practice across multiple different countries. And if you don't know about this as a compliance practitioner, you don't ask about it, uh, you find that your stakeholders often think if it's something that's deeply embedded and entrenched in culture, compliance policies don't apply. And therefore, when your compliance policy says don't give cash, everyone assumes that unless the funeral um, environment is directly addressed in a training, that it's fine because this is a cultural practice and the policy doesn't apply. So as a compliance officer, once you're aware of cultural practices to make sure that they're addressed, in training and to show your colleagues that you understand about their practices and you're working with them, it puts you in a much better position to be an effective compliance officer. So I have found that while I'm certainly not in someone else's shoes, um, I'm not exactly that person, traveling and living with them puts me in a better position to understand and have knowledge that helps me as a compliance officer. And finally, another basic maths one, um, creating opportunities in New Zealand, we have limited um, opportunities for us where we, we don't have a whole lot of multinational headquarters. Um, even Asia Pacific headquarters are not often in New Zealand. You'll see them in Singapore, Shanghai, Hong Kong, in a sprinkling of other places, but typically not New Zealand. So uh, you multiply your opportunities uh, by, by taking an adventure overseas. And I, as I mentioned, I thought I was um, a, a fairly um, all-knowing adult. Uh, transpired I wasn't. So I wanted to share some of the things that I've learned um, in the last 10 years. And I think a key one is no single country does everything really, really well. And I'm gonna say that includes New Zealand. And I know you're probably pretty impressed about New Zealand's response to coronavirus, uh, but we still have <laughs> multiple limitations in, in our country. And that's something that I've, I've begun to learn um, and embrace is what are the things I like about the country I've lived in and how can I take that knowledge um, into the next place and bring it with me as part of my, my life practices. Another thing is that you can have culture shock where you may not expect it. So uh, New Zealand is a Western country, the United States is a Western country, um, but when I moved to Boston, uh, I had quite a, quite a bit of culture shock. I'd never lived in Massachusetts before and most of the Americans I knew were either New Yorkers, Californians, Texans, 
And I had no idea about um, what is referred to in Massachusetts as mass holes. And it was a real shock. So um, that, was, that was really interesting. I think same goes for Asia. Just because you've been to Thailand doesn't mean that you know how to act in China. Uh, so you must be open about the different cultures everywhere, even if it's the same region, there may be some similarities, but certainly distinct differences. I've also realized that it can be incredibly lonely, um, especially if you move solo, which has been uh, the case for me a lot of the time. And so um, as advice for that, keep up relationships with your connections. Thankfully, modern technology is a real helper here. And, um, and it's not so lonely once you settle in. Um, have you found, Mary, have you yeah. found that, that you, were, you were mentioning about, about the technologies, have you found that it makes you, it, while it keeps you connected, has it, have you found it keeps you from being able to truly integrate in the place you're going with a constant eyeball back to where you were? Um, you know, I think one thing that I noticed with expats um, when I was in New Zealand is that they quite often they use the, often use the term in my country, blah, 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 blah. And, and I think some New Zealanders found that a bit off-putting at times because you're like, well, but, but we can't apply what happens in your country because it's here. And so um, what I have found is to really immerse myself in the country uh, okay. that I'm in and not keep using New Zealand as a comparison uh, for the very important point of number one on this slide, which is that uh, New Zealand is not the best at everything. And even if it is the best at something in the context of, um, say Dubai, maybe it won't work in Dubai. So um, what I noticed was that I was clinging a lot to being on Facebook initially when I first moved to Singapore. And then um, in order to make new friends, I used um, an, a, a, an expat website to meet other friends. And, uh, and naturally I gravitated away from being on Facebook all the time, messaging people because I was meeting with my new Singapore friends. So it's important to keep the balance of remembering not to just completely um, abandon your, your old friends because the, they've been around for you for a, a really long time um, and to make sure that you've got that balance. Good, thanks. Okay. And then the creating opportunities. Um, again, so, so many different opportunities here, um, the travel, the work, new friends, uh, you're simply multiplying the environment around you. And then the bravery one. I didn't think about this until I'd been away from home for about four years and I was in Singapore on a business trip and I was in a taxi with a lady and it's quite uncommon to have what we refer to as a taxi auntie. Usually it's a, an uncle in the, the taxi and she was asking me about myself and when she'd heard about all the countries that I'd moved to, she said to me, wow, you're really brave. Singaporean girls wouldn't typically do that. And it stopped me for a moment because I'd never thought of myself as brave. And, but if you think about the stress that comes with moving house, uh, the fact that I'd moved countries, uh, changed jobs multiple times without really understanding what I was getting myself into, it was pretty brave. Uh, and um, I'm really glad that someone else brought that home to me uh, as, as a lesson learned there. So before I talk about the three um, various adventures on this slide, I wanted to talk for a second about what are some of the things, if you're not sure whether it's a good time for you to move, if you're not sure whether it's for you, there are some indicators that I've observed from my circumstances and other people that I've noticed can make you particularly um, um, in the right point in time in your life for, for making a, a big life move, such as a country move. One of them is if, if you've found yourself just coming out of a really difficult situation and you're looking for a fresh start. So um, if you've come out of a, a significant relationship, for example, uh, moving overseas can be a really good time or a good opportunity to take your fresh start. If you're working for a company where you find yourself loving everything about it, the culture, the people, the kind of work that you do, but you don't see there being room for progression um, and you're, you're keen for progression, perhaps your boss isn't going anywhere anytime soon, um, transferring to another office could be another opportunity that keeps you in the job, um, but at a higher level and, and promoted to a position that you'd prefer to be in. Um, another one is um, if you love to travel. Um, if you love to travel and you can't get enough of it and you need to have trips lined up every, you know, three times a month, that's, that's me, by the way. Um, uh, me too. <laughs> and me three. You're yeah. amongst friends. Um, 
Um, an, an overseas trip could be really good for you. And finally, if, there's, if you find yourself as someone who can't sit still, your attention is drawn to lots of different things. You love novelty, you love innovating, um, you love meeting new people. Uh, this could be a good opportunity for you. So the three items that I've laid out here are different types of moves that you can make. The first is an expat, which means that you're a foreign worker in another country. The second is secondment, which typically is an intercompany transfer and you move from one office to another, potentially keeping the same role and responsibilities that you've been doing, um, potentially at a slightly higher level or even different duties than what you've been doing, but typically within the same organization that you've been working in and you remain an employee of the mother organization that you started with. And then the third one is residency and residency has got two aspects. The first is that um, like me, you might have uh, different branches of heritage and by your birthright or um, uh, other aspects of heritage, you have the right to live in another country without a company sponsoring you for a visa. And or the other is you start off as number one as an expat and then you get um, some kind of residency in the country. For example, if you lived in Hong Kong for seven years, you can get permanent residency there. And so there are different ways in which you can make the move and some suit you more than others. I've done just about everything. I'm in a secondment right now, but I didn't move. So one and three for me. All right, so here's here are, here are some advice on the next slide about if you're ready to make a move, but you're not quite sure where to start. The first thing is to tell someone what it is that you want. Most managers I find tend to assume that people just wanna do an upwards promotional trajectory and they don't think outside the box beyond that. So if you're ambitious, but your ambition is outside the box, let someone know, and not just your own boss, although that person's often a good sponsor, but also build your connections and overseas offices of the company that you work for and let those people know that you're also interested. Um, an easy one would be the head of the global head of, of your function. So for those of you who are listening and who are compliance officers, let the global head of compliance know that you're interested um, and see if they've got some thoughts as to um, what positions might be available to you in the future. Uh, and I say that because international transfers are one of the easiest ways. I've certainly moved myself from applying from overseas and that's definitely possible as well. However, you get the most support and it's easiest and you have less new things to, um, to, to tire you out than with a whole new experience. I'd also ask you, you to consider secondments, which are when you stay somewhat tethered to the origin place where you're from, but you get to move to another place for a temporary period of time. And this can be a really great way to, to get your overseas experience if you're unable to get a full transfer to another country. Another uh, piece of advice would be to speak to recruiters who get international postings and understand where more opportunities exist. So for example, um, at, at least sort of 10 years ago, uh, it was easier to get a legal job in Singapore than it was in Hong Kong, where they had a very good um, supply of, of local and expat um, uh, people already on the ground in Hong Kong. So Singapore had more opportunities, but of course things change. So getting an understanding as to where your talents are, are required um, and looking for that demand uh, is gonna be a good strategy. And then if you happen, say you're like me, but I don't have the language skill, um, a lot of people with Chinese parents happen to be able to, to speak Mandarin. That's super useful if you wanna spend some time uh, in the Asia Pacific region, and of course applicable across the board for other regions. Mary, what about the thought? You know, those are those are great steps, but there's this this feeling in many employees about either going away from where the decisions are being made, do and the ability of do I come back? Can I find a way back? Mm -hmm. Any yeah. any thoughts on 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 both of those as as, yeah. as hindrances for people taking this yeah. step? So I think your first question presumes that you work for an American headquartered company. Uh, so for me, if I was to move from the US to Frankfurt or Bad Homburg specifically, um, which is where my company's headquartered, I'd be actually moving towards where mm -hmm. the decisions are being made. So there's that um, reverse aspect as well. Right. If you're moving away from a headquarters or a very influential um, uh, a sector of your company, 
um, there's nothing stopping you from staying in really good contact with those key decision makers and influencers. Remaining in, in a good relationship with people uh, is, is is the best way for you to stay in the loop. Um, and also let people know, you know, as you said, as I said about letting people know when you want to leave, let people know that you intend to come back <laughs> so that they're thinking strategically um, in the medium and long term about what your career might look like once you've done your stint. What I would say as well is that that 10 years ago when I was making the leap to Singapore, in my mind at the time was the plan to work in Singapore for two years. We're now 10 years later and I've traversed multiple continents in that time. So as a, a result of your question, what I would advise is be really open-minded that this leap of faith that you could be about to embark on could be the start of the medium term chapter for you, not necessarily that shorter stint that you have in mind. Yeah, in my case, when made a made a step, thinking I knew what the next step after that was going to be, and having some agreement about it, but through the course of it, decided that wasn't actually the next step, mm -hmm. and moved on. The other the other interesting point is, um, it really does demonstrate moving away from the center of power. Also demonstrates team player, especially mm -hmm. if you understand if they understand that you do want to come back. Yeah, exactly. So my own question for you, Mary, is um, how do you package up that? concept that you want to move somewhere like how do you package the why and do you have different talking points that you use with different people whether it's your contacts that are not at the company versus contacts within the company like what really sells this idea um, and helps you get the buy-in that you need to have people actually pulling in your direction that's a really great question especially when you might be in a position where you are the right-hand man or woman of um, your boss and they know that losing you is going to be detrimental to them. And in that type of conversation, what I've said and I genuinely meant it is, um, I will not leave you while you still need me, but I hope that you will be supportive of a decision that will develop me and make me happy. And I know that we will work together again sometime. So that type of discussion, keeping in mind their, their needs as well and ensuring that when you have this conversation with them, you're actually giving them planning time, right? Like if you're upfront about it and you can work on a plan together, that actually gives them an awful lot of control compared with if you just go off and say, oh, I found a job and here's my notice. So that, that type of conversation is uh, in the best interests oftentimes of the manager as well. And if you're framing it as we and working together, it's going to be much more helpful than I really want to go work overseas and, and not thinking about what that feeling of panic is going to be like for them, potentially feeling abandoned um, and, and that your personal interests are going to put them in a difficult position. So you want to load that discussion with how you've thoughtfully considered how it will impact them and how you've addressed any inconveniences for the individuals that you're walking away from. Um, you want to be really tactful about the fact that you're not leaving because of them. Um, and then when you're talking to the places you want to go, you want to assure them that you have a genuine interest in moving. I think what happens a lot of the time is to recruiters is that they get some interest in an overseas candidate. And then that person says, Oh, I've decided I'm, I'm not going to leave. So you want to okay. show that you're invested and tell and give your why. So um, maybe that's what Daniel referred to earlier. You want to be where all the decisions are made. You'd love some time in headquarters to be part of the strategic vision and decision making of the company. Um, and and you, you want to see how you can add value to that process. And you think you can do it because of XYZ projects that you've already run at the local level. So I would you definitely have to customize your conversation and remember you're asking for what you want, but you can't phrase it as, I want this because it's going to be best for me. That's implicit. You wouldn't be asking otherwise. So you want to make it come across, and, and hopefully it really is if you're a good person, um, that you've really thought through how this is going to affect the company, how it's going to be good for the company for you to get this move. And it can be as simple as, um, you are so loyal to this company that you know that your opportunities for promotion will fulfill you here and, and with an intra-company transfer that it's going to keep you happy and loyal to the company for longer. All right. And that's part of a bigger, a bigger 
strategy of managing your own career, whether it's moving physically to another country or moving within the organization, having those kinds of dialogue uh, ongoing is a smart idea. Absolutely. Yeah. And that brings me to the third part of, of the session, which is how can you give someone uh, who is new to your area, if you're on the other side of the fence and you're welcoming someone in, how can you give them a true sense of belonging? How can you make them feel included, even if they're a di diverse person compared to you and perhaps the majority of your colleagues in the office? And so I want to offer an approach and think about it in terms of when someone is in personal crisis, we tend to use the words, let me know if you need anything, I'm here for you. And I would say that that's being a good friend. But being a great friend is making it easy for someone to take up your advice. So you make it very specific. You let them take something from you. So examples that I've put here are, I'm having a quiet night in on Saturday. Um, shall I take your children for the evening and look after them for movie night so that you can have some time to yourself? Or if you're on the way to the supermarket, you don't just say, do you need anything? You say, what can I get for you? You make it easy for, for people to take your offer to help. So how do we convert this to the office environment where, where someone is new? The type of offer that I get, and I, I know there's really good intentions and it's awesome of people to say, what I tend to hear is, let me know if you have any questions. Of course I have questions, I don't know anything. So um, let, let's, let's think about some of the things that someone who's new uh, to your, your uh, community might have in mind. And I've got some um, specific actionable ideas, but I've also filled in um, a page here of the types of things that people don't know about. And if you'll allow me, I'm just gonna switch from presenting to reading off the page to just yeah. put out some of the things because it doesn't Please. matter whether you're junior in a company and you're not a subject matter expert at say compliance or data privacy and security, you can help anyone who's new, even if they're, um, you know, three levels of boss ahead of you. So some companies do have um, relocation experts that help them with some of this information. Uh, some of them don't. And some of them, I'm naturally very um, cynical, which makes me an excellent investigator, but perhaps not the most friendly of people. Um, and so I assume well, they, might be, they might be referring business um, and getting kickbacks for it. So I don't always trust the referrals that I get from the experts. So... I like to get a good smattering of advice. So here are some of the things that people might want to know about. Recommendations for utility companies, or even if they don't have a choice. For example, in my building, there is only one internet supplier that I can use. Doctor, dentist, discount websites like Groupon, internet shopping options, including groceries. Schools, neighborhoods, nightlife areas, tourist or must see places and must do experiences, veterinarians, home cleaning services, hair salons, spas, major events throughout the year, not just culture and, and customary, but also your workplace events, um, company and community interest groups, places to purchase furniture and household goods, local dishes of foods to try and which restaurants are famous for serving them. Oh, that's and, good. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the is to how public transport works. Yeah, that one's a, that's a biggie. That's huge. Explanation of how major public or customary holidays are celebrated. Um, comment, commentary um, balancing taxi versus ride sharing apps. Um, there are some places where you may as well not use, uh, say, for example, Uber or Lyft because taxi is the exact price and maybe regulated there or whatever. And, you know, I'm used to assuming that ride share apps are the cheapest everywhere, but sometimes that's um, uh, not always the case. Uh, places that are easy to go for weekend getaways. So that's a smattering of the type of thing this person is coming in with a real blank slate about for the most part. And they will certainly ask for it. Uh, so I tend to ask for these types of pieces of advice uh, over the course of months as they crop up. But if you can volunteer this information and be super helpful, you're making them feel like they have a place. You're making them feel like you care and that you're thinking about them and considering what might be going on in their life. Another thing to keep in mind is to understand that you may fall victim to in-group bias. What this is, is a preference for a group that you identify with, oftentimes people who are similar to you. And I refer to this as the old guard, the people who were in the office before you. 
to a lesser extent, they reject outsiders. So the good news about that is that they may not explicitly be awful to you, but you may notice almost microaggressions where they seem to prefer the viewpoints of colleagues who they're really familiar with and used to rather than yours as a new person coming in. And I want you to remember, studies do show that diversity makes for more successful teams. So how do you avoid this? Be really introspective with yourself, really self-aware about whether you are falling into that trap. Do you think someone's idea is terrible because it's actually terrible? Or is it because it's something you've never thought of before? Your first impression is that will never work in our, in our workplace, our environment, and you don't give it a chance. If you find yourself thinking that, or if you find yourself using the compliance risk term of, oh, we can't do that, it's the way, we, this is how we've always done things. Uh, you may be falling victim to in-group bias, uh, and you must challenge yourself in that circumstance. Uh, I think there's also a bias for if someone's got a different accent to yours. If someone speaks multiple languages, yep, their English is probably not gonna be smooth, but hey, can you speak three languages? Probably not. So be conscious of the fact that someone speaking multiple languages, um, just because they don't speak English the same way as you, doesn't necessarily make it bad. In fact, I, there was something I, I read recently about how um, we, we often treat English as if it's a, a signal of intelligence. It's not, it's just a language. Um, and then I would ask you to c c challenge the importance of cultural fit, because I think we often use culture fit as a way to perhaps unconsciously discriminate against people. And why is that? We assume that someone's not a good culture fit because they're not like the rest of us. They don't fit in, they don't say the same things we do. They don't look the same way we do. They don't dress the same way we do. And you, you can't really get stung for saying someone's a, a, a culture fit in terms of unlawful discrimination when applying for a job. So saying it's a bad culture fit is a really easy way to justify uh, an appropriate behavior. So again, ask yourself, do you really think this individual is, is gonna be detrimental to the team? Um, or is it just because they're a bit different? They don't look the same as you. You can't envisage yourself hanging out at a bar and having Friday night drinks with them. Who cares? You have friends for that. Your colleagues are not there to have drinks with you and make you feel comfortable about whether you can socialize with them or not. So. Try not to use culture fit um, as a way to turn away people who aren't like you because we know that there is unconscious bias in hiring and that is that we tend to choose people who are just like us. Uh, I've challenged myself very recently to be um, very conscious of who I'm hiring and I feel very comfortable with a lot of the diverse ways um, and the diverse aspects of, of the different employees that I've hired. There is one thing I've not been able to kick, uh, and I'd be interested for your views, uh, Daniel and, and Lisa Beth, as to whether you think this one's a problem. I cannot stop hiring people who are very specifically of the Maya Briggs personality type, ESFJ. And that's because I look for people who aren't terrible people, and I look for people who are reliable. So they do things on time. They don't let me down. Uh, and when I look for that in interview, so um, a nice person, who I can depend on, I invariably, even though I do different gender, different age, uh, different sexual orientation, um, if everything else different that I could possibly really know about, I still end up with ESFJ. And I still think that's a problem oh. because it means that those people have certain strengths and they'll tend to have the same strengths and it's leaving me with technical gaps. So do you guys have any thoughts on whether my diversity aspect needs to change there. Well, it's, it's interesting because I do think that um, oftentimes we as human beings are attracted to people that either help fill in gaps for ourselves um, or um, we view as um, easily uh, uh, someone that you can easily work with and are adaptable. Um, uh, you know, I think that we're learning more and more about how diverse groups um, and, and diverse mindsets mm -hmm. enrich the workforce. I'm not sure that I have a solution for you, but it does sound to me like you've at least uh, are aware that there is a personality type 
um, that isn't correlated with, you know, an economic, you know, bias or um, gender or anything else that um, y- y- you seem to be drawn to, to hiring and working around. But I'll offer a counterpoint um, that we, you know, Young was pretty clear about complementary thing, uh, um, personality styles that work well together and don't and produce good output. So you are you, you are your, you, your Myers-Briggs is what you are. And that will naturally have compatibility and good output with perhaps the same consistent style, which is why you are driving toward that for productivity, not necessarily for bias, um, because it's something, you know, has worked. Yeah. It's uh, it's important to, you know, to try and go outside that one to test yourself and see how well you do work well with others, but you may actually find that the best, um, you know, that the best compatibility for output for productivity is that. Um, and then it's not bias, it's product, it, it's about productivity. Thank you. I feel a lot better. And <laughs> what I will say about the, the, the diversity as well is this is what I have observed after I've selected the very best person for the job. So I keep in mind um, what's the, what is the job that needs to be filled and who out of all the candidates that have applied is going to be the best person to do that job. And, and after doing that, I notice, oh, this, this person is, is older than this person on my team, um, or, um, comes from a different country or, or whatever it may be. So I haven't gone out to cherry pick for diversity at the time. The aim is to get the best person for the job. What I've noticed is that as a natural result of genuinely looking for the best person for the job, I have ended up with an organically diverse uh, history of, of um, staff members. That's good. It proves out, the, it proves out the, the, the mindset that if we do, if we take those uh, phenotypes out of it, that, mm-hmm. that there is commonality across the, uh, across the, uh, across the, different, uh, the different demographics. Yeah. One quick question for you, though. You talked about um, in-group bias in, in the workplace. Um, expat life is one that um, when you physically relocate, oftentimes expats will physically live near each other or physically war- yeah. uh, spend time outside the office together. Or sometimes they're even required to in certain countries. Yeah, true. You, Conclave, you can't, enclaves. You, you, yeah, you live in enclaves. Um, how, how, have, how has that experience been for you? What have yeah. you found? And how have you overcome the gravity toward... Uh, well, maybe it's an entire Kiwi uh, uh, group in whatever place you end up in versus being able to get more of the local culture. That's a really great question. I, I, I learned a lesson, not necessarily a hard lesson, but a, I think an interesting one, which is when I first moved to Singapore and I joined the, the website to make friends, it was an expat website. Mm-hmm. So I think the majority of my friends initially were American, uh, which is at least not all Kiwis. Um, but it was people who are not local, essentially. And um, I think someone commented on a friend's post on Facebook, um, you know, from what I can tell of living in Singapore, there are only white people, something like that. Um, and it, 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 it made me realize that if you're, you're gravitating towards people who have a similar background to you, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's where you're comfortable, you've got stuff in common initially when I think it becomes a bad thing is if you do that to exclude the idea of being open to friendships with others. So um, I'm, uh, I say this, people who know me now don't believe this, but I, I, I am still, I think, but was in- incredibly much more so before, very, very shy and introverted. And it was so hard for me to make that first move in Singapore. I made basically no new friends uh, for the first three months, but I was working in a law firm and it was basically work, sleep, work, sleep. And, um, after that period of time, I moved in house to um, Tata Communications, which allowed me much more of a work life balance. And uh, in time, I got to know some of my colleagues very well. Some of them were um, foreigners, but a lot of my foreign um, friends at Tata are, also have Asian heritage. So I love that aspect of people who'd come from really similar backgrounds to me who understood what it was like growing up in a Western country, but with Asian heritage. So that's as bad as. Um, people like me, as you can get, it's the right. category, uh, and um, and then making friends with my local colleagues as well. And I'm very pleased to say that to this day, I'm still friends with um, people from both groups. And so, 
it actually, it may have been easier, I think, to start off because, you know, in that settling in stage, everything's new. So with people who had a similar background to me, that was, it, it was handy. Like it, people who understood when you first go to a new country, there's an awful lot of uncertainty. You, you right. question yourself about whether you've made the right decision, whether, especially if you've never been there before, you're like, oh, can I actually live here? I, I, I didn't really think that one through. Um, and then after that, make sure that you're looking for friends in, in all places, not just on that expat website. I think that's a good point, Daniel. And I'd forgotten about that until you mentioned it. In the US, I didn't use any expat websites. All of my friends um, are Americans. There's one Kiwi lady at work. Um, we're friendly with each other. I don't socialize uh, with her. Uh, I, I just socialize with American friends. I don't really know other expats uh, in, in Boston. And um, in fact, a couple of my good friends are in the compliance profession and I met them um, through Christy Grant Hart. I put a call out. This is one of the best things that you can do when you move to another place. Ask your friends, um, do you know of anyone in this new country um, that you could connect with me with? And you may not end up being friends with them um, for the long haul, but most people, and this is a good people tend to know good people. So right. if you're friendly with someone you like them and they've got a referral for you, um, that person's probably going to be someone that you enjoy the company of as well. And they, um, tend to, and I do this every time, I'll, if someone asks me for this favor, I'll take their friend out for a meal and give them as much information as I can about the settling in process and, and so on. Good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Very cool. And I'd like to just uh, let you guys know there was a nice little comment in the chat um, about how much one of our uh, listeners enjoyed hearing your story and felt like it was reflective of his own experience um, moving from Latin America over to Europe. So um, it, so it's really resonating with a lot of people. Thank, thank, you. So, thank, thank you, Mary. Continuing that through. Yeah. All right. So um, the next slide here is a little more on how to be a good corporate citizen. So how to be more inclusive. I know many of you want to, but you're maybe stuck on some specific thoughts. So in addition to that laundry list, when I read off the page, um, share your thoughts on areas to live in. But I would say ask their requirements first. So for me, um, as a single woman um, loving the inner city Boston life, uh, that may not be so suitable for a family of five who wants to be near to our offices, which are in the western suburbs of, of Massachusetts. So it's all very well and good to say from my perspective, this is an awesome place to live. Um, do know what situation they're in and then offer your thoughts based on that. If you find that they, um, their interests correlate nicely with your type of neighborhood, invite them to come visit, show them around um, at the weekend. Um, explain the utilities things. Um, it's small, small things that you take for granted when you live in a country, but even just how much of a deposit do I need to put down? Do you need to put one down? that kind of thing they'll need to know about. Um, ask about the necessities. So for me, um, uh, single and no children, I like to go to the spa sometimes. Um, maybe your average other person isn't really into that. So hold back on offering the, the recreational things that, that you do um, and figure out what it is that they're gonna be interested in. Most of us do all need our hair cut though. So things like that are usually pretty safe. Doctor and dentist. Um, I believe one of my old colleagues um, from the red flag group, Varun, is listening in. Um, Varun was very fastidious about his um, his health, and he was the perfect person to um, give me advice for for um, a great physician um, practice to to go to. So um, that kind of thing, everyone's going to need at some point. Um, and and anything that find out what their hobbies are, and that also shows that you're interested in them. I'd argue that all of these apply as well. As someone who's moved physically, even in even within even a country, within even if you're not an expat, <laughs> these are the questions I want anytime I land in a new exactly. city. <laughs> exactly. And so when I when I was talking to to you guys about the session, sort of thinking about conceptually how how you know what's the type of audience that this would appeal to, it's not necessarily um, expat in the, the, the foreign country sense, it could be someone moving from Alabama to Boston. Right. You're going to need to, to know about these types of things too. So it's very much a, what if it's someone from a, a different area to the home place that you're from? Um, and then social hangouts. Um, most people, 
like to hang out occasionally. Um, and so giving them your favorite spots. Um, you might have a friend in your personal life who shares a common interest. So feel free to introduce them. You can let your work and personal life collide for that because you might be making a really great connection. Um, I know that you don't have to be friends with everyone in the office. And I want to make that really clear when I say you, know, you can be inclusive and you can make someone feel like they belong without compromising who you would typically hang out with. You should never hang out with people in your personal time that you don't feel comfortable with or that you don't feel is a great use of, of your time. Um, but to the extent that you do and the, or that you're really open to to finding out whether this might be a good connection for, for you. Invite them out after hours for team drinks. Um, if you're a little more shy um, or you, you you just don't want to do it one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, or, or a one-on-one -on -one experience. And I'll share one of my stories. Uh, when I first moved to Boston, um, a, a gentleman in the department who I, I'd say from just about every demographic uh, is different to me. Um, with the exception, we both I uh, have law degrees, uh, but he was in the military first, so not like for like necessarily people there. And he said, hey, would you would you like to, 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 to hang out um, after work tonight? And I didn't have anything to do. And I said, sure, why not? And he is one of my BFFs at work to this day, um, because even though we came from completely different backgrounds, we have a really similar sense of humor um, and we enjoy a lot of the same things. So um, if you're open to expanding your social circle, even if it doesn't look like that person is someone you'd normally hang out with, remember that's probably in-group bias getting in the way a little bit there. So be open-minded to it. And even if it just ends up being a welcome drink and you think, oh, probably won't hang out with this person again, you've really done your part to be a good corporate citizen by giving them a warm welcome. And then in the work space, um, make sure that you invite their comments and feedback. Some people may not feel so comfortable speaking up when they're new. Uh, give this person an opportunity to have a voice. Um, support them, be an ally. And if you yourself may have done a great job at inviting this person out, um, but think about um, encouraging your other colleagues to also make an effort. Just because you're a good corporate citizen doesn't necessarily mean that everyone else is thinking along the same lines. So see if you can do a rotation service of taking them out um, so that they have more than one good lunch with you. And then let them know of any social interest groups that they might want to join. So for example, when I first joined Fresenius in the United States, uh, there's a woman's employee resource group and a couple of people forwarded me um, and got me signed up for that really early on. The other thing that I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask you to consider, and I haven't put it on a slide because this is asking you to get really personal here, um, but I think it's a really important one, is when your country is celebrating um, an important festivity, particularly one where family is valued, and for that I'm thinking Chinese New Year, Thanksgiving, that type of thing, ask yourself, is there room at our family table to include this person, especially if there's someone who hasn't come to your country with a family, because it allows them to experience a new custom completely, and you get to delight in sharing that, that knowledge and that custom with someone else, but it's also a really hard time. Um, if you're in a new country and you know that it's a big deal public holiday and you're not getting to experience it properly. And if you if you there genuinely isn't room at your table, if you're already bursting at the seams, think about whether there are other ways. So for example, at Christmas, if your family does eggnog and, and other things on Christmas Eve instead of on Christmas day, um, because then Christmas Day might be too packed to be able to include someone or you've got some special rule about it being family only. Think about whether you, you can incorporate them in the Christmas Eve celebrations instead. So I know I'm asking a lot there because this person isn't family. Um, so it's asking you to be really open-minded about what you can offer encouraging your family to get into the spirit of, of being given, giving and open-hearted and also open-minded. But think about the opportunities for you. If you've got children who um, don't necessarily get to hang out with people from New Zealand, um, that's a great learning chance for them to ask them what another country is like, what their holiday practices are like. Um, it's just a whole new world of experience. And that is, I think, one of the number one things uh, that made me feel like I belonged in another country and in a community was when people invited me to join them for their family festivities. Yeah, I, I will say I always like inviting people to um, 
Thanksgiving, um, if, if it's possible. I have had um, one of my former Brazilian uh, direct reports um, celebrated Thanksgiving. I don't think she really loved the 5K turkey trot that we did at the beginning of the day, but dinner was fantastic and we had a lot of wine. And of course, the rest of the family was on uh, their best behavior. I think she'd come back for dinner, maybe not for the turkey trot in Minnesota weather in November. Um, but you know, I mean, right. It was a real experience. <laughs> does, New, does New Year's, uh, do visitors get New Year's day dips in uh, Lake Superior? Polar well? plunges. It's polar yeah. plunges. Polar, right? Thank yeah. you. <laughs> but those are the things that memories are made of, right? Exactly. They really are because they're unique and they give a person a chance to experience what a local does versus what a tourist might do yeah. or what the world perceives that a local does. And that's a big difference between those two things. And, and what I love about what you did here, Mary, is um, your, your tips for inclusion are, are not for expats exclusively at all. Mm -hmm. Frankly, anybody who's joined your office, anybody mm -hmm. who is new to your organization, um, being new to an organization, I always think it's like having a new job um, on top of the new job on top of the new job, right? Because you've got your professional and personal contacts that you're trying to manage. You're trying to manage a new community. You're trying to manage a new organization or a different place within the organization. So those first couple of um, months and, and year are really, really challenging. Exactly. I think we've come to the end of the um, prepared presentation. Oh, sorry. No, I have another slide. It's a, it's a bonus one. I love it when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe while I'm sharing this one, if anyone's got any questions that they want to pop into the Q&A, now is a great time. Um, and so here's my tips for maintaining the inclusion. Um, and, and repeating that point, you don't have to be friends with, with everyone. I'm not asking you to be. Um, and you don't have to be to be inclusive. So uh, check in with your colleagues, especially the ones that you don't socialize uh, with. And the reason for that is that after our homes, the workplace is where we next feel the biggest sense of belonging. Um, and so you don't have to be friends to ask someone how they're going. You don't have to be friends to say, how are you faring in this crazy um, coronavirus pandemic? Um, ask yourself, if I was the head of belonging as a job title, how would I interact with colleagues to live my job values and goals? And I, interest, um, I saw this recently, I think it's at Alexion Pharmaceuticals. They've actually got this job going at the moment. It's a real position. Oh, how cool. When you're stuck, think about asking for advice beyond your usual council of advisors. So those people, your besties at work that you run to whenever there's a, a drama or a scandal um, or you've accidentally um, copied in the person that you were complaining about into the email that you just sent, and you need some advice, think about asking that new person in the office for their perspective. And then finally, um, validate the contributions of everyone. In meetings, we tend to be really quick to jump on, oh, such a good idea of, of our in-group people. Don't forget to do that with people who aren't in your in-group as well. Um, and also, you don't even have to like the idea. You, you're just liking the fact that they were willing to contribute, and you can be positive about that. So that brings us to the end of the presentation now. And uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. And sometimes Daniel and Lisa Beth have some as well. Well, I wanted to thank you for um, giving this presentation. It's so timely when we talk about how to make people feel like they belong and um, can find their way, um, especially the part about being a good corporate citizen um, and a good citizen in general, right? When you're visiting another place, you are representative of a whole host of people that you know may not have voted to have you be their representative. So behaving properly and, and making sure that you're connecting with people is so important. Um, one of the things we always ask is, what's the best advice that you have ever received from a mentor? Oh, that's a good one. Um, when I was really, um, really, really fresh to the workforce, I met a woman who um, was a, a judge in New Zealand and I was nervous about my future. Um, I, the way I did what we call opinions in law school in New Zealand, and I guess similar to here, is I was so dumb in that I assumed that everything the professor taught me in class, they assume I knew 
and then in the opinions that you get tested on, you have to give them information and analysis that's off your own mind. So stuff that you're thinking yourself. And if you think about the pyramid of answers, I'd be aiming for those top peak answers and missing all that base layer at the bottom, which is simply regurgitating back what they taught me. And so I did pretty poorly um, for my first couple of years on essays, which took up a, a, a big part of our um, our scoring system um, when we had to write legal opinions. And so I came out of law school the first couple of years without um, uh, A grades. I was a B and C student and it wasn't until I figured out oh, the professor wants to know that you heard what they said and can remember it and apply it. And then I started getting better grades. But of course that affected my, my average. And I was really nervous about not being an A grade student because like the United States, we have an oversupply of lawyers in New Zealand compared with um, the actual number of jobs available. And this lady said to me, don't worry. Um, in fact, BNC students make the best lawyers and um, all you need to do is focus on one area and know it really well. Become a subject matter expert at that one area. Be top of the game in that niche area you're, you'll be um you'll be the, the go-to person for that and you will be successful that's great advice yeah and i think resonates probably a lot with with people in risk and compliance because it is a it's a fairly well it's broad within the the, the risk compliance ethics privacy area it's fairly narrow fairly specific when you consider the whole the whole realm of business uh, of business topics that's really neat. Thanks, Mary. We had one question that came in uh, as well around, uh, is homesickness inevitable? Uh, and if so, what's your favorite remedy? What's my favorite remedy? Remedy, yeah. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, so I think homesickness has to be, and I think that's also what causes people to say, in New Zealand, we do this. Um, and keep <laughs> up to that, um, that you're not trying to show your, your, your home customers as being superior homesickness for me kicks in when I'm visiting home more than when I'm away from home, which I think is different to the experiences of some of my colleagues. How I remedy it is really seizing the day because I know that when I go back to New Zealand eventually, and that is uh, my plan, um, is that I won't have all of these amazing travel opportunities at my fingertips. I won't get to go to compliance conferences every five seconds like we get to do in a non-pandemic phase. Um, so it is understanding that uh, I've got a broad base of experience of, of, of uh, knowledge and time in New Zealand. I'm going to have it again. So I need to make the most of the time that's available to me now, um, trying new experiences, meeting new people. And I always ask myself whenever I go back to New Zealand, is it time to move back? So I think it's important to allow yourself that freedom and, and scope to make the decision to to succumb to the homesickness. There's also a really interesting um, phrase um, called uh, reverse culture shock. And that's what happens when uh, people who have been expats in one country and been accustomed to the ways of living overseas, then find themselves uh, moving back to their home country. And I think that's gonna be a reality that I will suffer from for a long time. There are many things that I've enjoyed about the, the international lifestyle uh, that I will not have as a privilege when I when I go back to New Zealand. I can confirm that I'm almost 15 years back and still culture shocked about coming back. Mm -hmm. you know, there's things I love about the U.S., but there's definitely things I miss about being out in the world. Yeah. Well, Mary, thank I, you so much. Thank you so much. We are so thrilled to have you here today. We'll make sure that this is available for um, people who weren't able to attend live. Um, and um, just thanks again for all of your insights and um, thoughts on this topic.